Hello, welcome everyone. We are live here from New York Jazz Workshop. My name is Vito Leszczak and I'm here with the, with the great Jay Leonhardt. Um, I would like to keep our presentation as interactive as it can be, so if at any time questions come up, just unmute yourself and uh, speak up. Be happy to answer all the questions that arise. So um, let me introduce Jay a little more. This young man next to me was born in 1940. He had an incredible career over more than 60 years now. Um, he's probably one of the most recorded bass players in business, I would think. Oh, somewhere here. Somewhere there. there's, there's, there's a few more. Like maybe Crenshaw has a few more, but you know, we Crenshaw, have quite a few. Mill Temple, George de Vivier, and Ron Carter, and a few others. Yeah. But you know, I mean, I did my share. I did my share. I'm not complaining. I mean, I have a whole list here. I don't even remember everyone who played with Louis Jackson, Jim Hall, and Connett, Mary McPartland, Jerry Mulligan, Phil Woods, Dad Jones, Mel Lewis, Tony Bennett, Peggy Lee. And then, you know, not just like the jazz side, and he also ended up playing and recording with James Taylor, Taylor, Ozzy Osbourne, and Queen Latifah, for example, which is very interesting having, you know, the both sides, like the jazz experience, but also the studio part. Yes, well, the studio thing is <clears throat> is how I, uh, back when I came to New York, there was a, a robust, as they say, the big word these days, robust, everything's robust, but with the scene, the studio scene was, was quite active. And if you uh, could get into it, you could make a living playing in studios. Some people made tremendous living. But I always kept going out of town. I, my problem was I could get, somebody would call and I'd say, okay, let's go to Toronto for two weeks. Okay, fine. Or let's go to Europe and I'll bring the whole family and things like that. You know? So, so I, I bordered on very busy in the studios. Uh, the guys who stayed home, they could be reliable. What are you going to do? You have to do what you do. Which is kind of interesting just from, from the scene because it has changed so much. Like the studio oh. work has completely dried up. It's almost very few. There's like some things. Just That's records. Not like it used to be. No, know? it's just records. Mm -hmm. People making records. Very few commercials use live, certainly not live days. Mm -hmm. And they don't have to use it. I think it can be done. I mean, I work. We all work now with, you know, our, our, our own. Logic Pros or variations of, of uh, music software. And then you can do all kinds of stuff, you know. And the world gets used to fake instruments yeah. and perfect time. That's what bothers me is these instruments have such a perfect time, you feel like I've just dropped into another universe. There's no, there's no, there's no human factor involved, you know, mm -hmm. where, where the time is a little sloppy and you know, oh, a real person just did that. Oh, goody. No, it's just... Just and it, everything's so perfect that you can't wait to hear human beings play. I can't. I mean, that's actually not a topic I didn't want to touch onto it now, but I sometimes think it's a problem of jazz recordings these days too, because everything can be fixed. There's you know no more mistakes on jazz records, and that's not what it used to be. No. The, the human element is completely gone. Like every little mistake gets fixed, and it, it, it ends up sounding a little sterile. Yeah, listen, little listen to Miles on Kind of Blue. He yeah. makes a thousand mistakes on yeah. that on album. He you know can't remember can't remember a lyric. Can't, can't find a certain note. He just plays something else. You know he really had in mind what it was, or, but he he couldn't find it. Mm. You know, and now people play those songs with those mistakes. But it is quite some of the creative process. You know, if you take that part away, it becomes so completely manufactured. Yeah, well, well, yeah, right. The hell of it. Uh -huh. Do make records like mine. <laughs> so, you know, let's just broaden out a little bit before we focus just on bass and drums. But, like, what were your first rhythm section influences? Like, that on bass? bass on, yeah, I, like even like as a whole rhythm section, not like just from an well, instrument. Well, my first, my first real influence was Freddie Green. Freddie Green, you know, played bass guitar for Count Basie. Chum, 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 
I used to listen to that and just amaze at how they paced the guitar hooked up, you know, and how they just, and I, and that's why I was playing rhythm guitar at the time. I was a kid, you know, band, banjo and rhythm guitar and stuff like that. And uh, uh, just that, that sound of that bassy band just killed me. And Oscar Peterson and, and with Ray Brown, I mean, uh, they, they had, they got a, they hooked up so hard it was just impossible not to dance when they were playing, you know. Mm -hmm. So it definitely like from the groove. Yeah, the rhythm. I was a pure rhythm, rhythm player, rhythm. and the fact that I knew any notes at all amazed me, because it was just mm -hmm. all rhythm. My family, we used to sit around outside. I had five brothers and sisters. There were six altogether, and sometimes we would sit around on the on the street or on the pavement in the backyard and just take tin cans and go. Somebody else would enter a beep, boop, beep, boop. And we'd have the hippest little rhythm section going on back there because everybody in the family had that time. So did your brothers, sisters play any other instruments? Well, my brother played guitar. My older brother played guitar. My younger brother was a flute player. He played, he played combat flute in uh, Vietnam. That was his contribution. And my younger sisters all played guitar and piano. They don't do it professionally, but they, they were all very good. Quite a musical family. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was all my mother's influence. It's kind of funny that tradition continues too. Uh, yeah, through yes. you, you, through you. Right, right. Son right. and daughter and son. Right. I always, didn't you go to an early concert with your brother in Baltimore to see Duke Ellington? Duke Ellington, yes. It was 12 years old. Yeah. I was 12 years old. I walked in and we sat down and Duke Ellington, and we, there was nobody there. Eight o'clock. It was supposed to start at eight o'clock. There was nobody there. No audience, no musicians. My brother and I sat there wondering what is going on. All of a sudden, Duke Ellington walks in, says hello to us, goes to the piano, and starts to write and play. And he's sitting there for 20 minutes writing, playing. And then all of a sudden, in walks Sam Woodyard. And he sits at the piano, and, they, and Sam starts going. And Ellington goes. Bling, bling. And then in walked John Lamb. I think it was John. I don't remember who the, the bass player was at the time. And they start playing blues. And then one by one, the, the, the whole orchestra files in. And everybody takes a chorus. Everybody takes a chorus. And then they go, And so forth. Uh, I forgot the name, but I always forget the name of the song, but it's a big Ellington hit. You know what it is? Uh, yeah, I know the song, but I don't know the title. All right, I'm I sure forgot. someone there on Zoom probably knows. Somebody knows what it is. But just, I, I, was, I love about that story that, you know, like everyone just tricked it in. It was kind of such a fluid yeah. process. Yeah, it was yeah, not yeah. Like, you know, like this big presentation. I mean, it's the most amazing band at that time, yeah. Ellington's band. Well, Ellington, Ellington was not big on discipline, disciplining people uh -huh. in the band. I mean, I, I had a chance to meet him in, uh, later on and, and do a little bit with him. And, uh, and he just took it easy. If you weren't responsible, you'd get fired. That's all. If you couldn't show up and do the gig, you'd get fired. But you could show up 15 minutes later. Yeah, well, they change. all they all got into the habit of showing up late yeah. because they, they knew it did nothing. Started at eight o'clock. It started at eight forty-five. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But and, and oh my God, the sound of that band! What they did and how they played was just phenomenal. So let's focus now a little bit on the bass and drums relationship. What are the let's say three or five like most important things? You would like to, or you would like to hear from a drummer, or expect from a drummer. Well, from a drummer, I, I, if they've gotten to this point, you know they're listening to you. They're listening, and they know how to listen. They're not just playing the drums, but they're actually playing with what's going on around them. Like a, a mediator, they're playing. They're letting people say what they say. They throw in his ideas. And as far as the bass is concerned, well, what I love about a good drummer is a guy who can just, from the start, as soon as he hits those drums, the, the groove is there. 
the group was there. Now, they all, the, the, the chief of that was Steve Gadd, still is Steve Gadd. As soon as he starts to play, it's right there. You just feel it. The second beat, you all of a sudden got what he's got in mind. It doesn't take him four bars, six bars. He just knows exactly what he wants to play, and it happens. And I love that because then you can, you can, you can dig right in, and he's listening to you. If they trust you, they listen to you, and they play with you. And uh, most good drummers who succeed learn to listen. That's, that's, to me, the most important thing. You know, just good time and good listening. The rest of it, it'll be personality. Yeah, yeah after those two things, everything falls in place anyway. Once you yeah, listen, yeah. you adjust and right. you play what's necessary. Right. I mean, you've got to be musicians. You know, drummers are musicians. You know, mm -hmm. they don't just drum. I mean, the, all the great ones have been sensational musicians. You know, yourself included. Oh. <laughs> Excuse me. I got, it. I, I got it. I got it. Kiss up to the host a little bit. You know. <laughs> but it's true. Yeah, no, I feel about the same with the bass player. You know, when it's about their time and their ability to listen. Like once that's there, you can negotiate any territory. Because it's like in different situations here, like everyone has different conceptual ideas where music should go, conceptual, different conceptual ideas where the time should you know, lie. And once the, the bass player and the, the drummer kind of understand each other through listening and you know, with their time, they can negotiate all that territory. Right. And yeah. then in, in this, once they find their space, it provides the space for the rest of the band to happen. Right, well, all well, the band loves it when the bass player and drummer get along. Yeah. Rhythmic music will get along. It's very, very important to any band I've ever played in. When you, when you, the heartbeat is there, boy, the rest of the band just climbs on, jumps on, and loves it. Mm -hmm. You know, but when it doesn't work, they, they get sour kind of quick. Yeah, it kind of throws everyone off. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. They don't want to complain about it, but they quiet on the way on the way home. <laughs> you hear about it. Find them standing in the corner. <laughs> <laughs> um, should we? Do you want to talk about like one music example? Maybe we should be listen to some uh, Louis Bassey. Yeah, know? well, Louis, Louis was. Uh, I got it. It's oh no, that was who the drummer was. It was Louis Bellson. In, uh, was, Ellington Bay. Yeah, it, yeah, it was Louis Bellson. It was Louis Bellson. Yeah, right. It was Louis Bellson. And and I, I watched Louis play, and I just adored what he did, and I just couldn't believe that this anybody could play the drums so beautifully. And 20 years, less than 20 years later, I was working with him, playing bass with him in New York. And uh, I loved playing with him. Besides being a prince of a human being, he was a beautiful drummer and such a great soloist. Such a great soloist. I mean, his, 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 his solos had soul to them, too. They weren't just gymnastics mm -hmm. like other great, some other great solos, drum solos, where they could avoid gymnastics. But he always said something. You know, he always said something. Like you do. Right there, I've done it again. Which is interesting with Louis because he had, you know, he had enormous technique too. Oh, he, yeah. he just like cho chose it very wisely how to apply it. And, and it was like a real decision. Let's, there, there's one record uh, Jay did. I forgot the, what's the title of the record. Peaceful Thunder or Thunder or something with Louis? Oh, about, yeah, Peaceful Thunder. That's the title of the record. And I would like to play a little bit one track from that uh, recording. Uh, the track is called Soar Like an Eagle. It's Louis Bassman and uh, Leonhardt and a bunch of other people. Um, I get into it now. Marvin Stan, Ted oh. Wait, it's not connected to the Beatles. Marvin Stan, Ted Nash, Louis, Derek okay, Smith, and myself. Let's try that again. <laughs> Thank you. 
Oh, we missed the bass solo. That was the best part, but oh. that's okay. No, that wasn't trumpet solo, no. no. <laughs> Should I fast forward to the bass solo? We have a bunch of examples already, but yeah. I don't know if you have time for to listen to the whole tune. Well, I always tell bass players it's not in the solo to get you the gigs. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty much for any rhythm section player. Yeah, right? It's not how you solo. I mean, it's fine to solo well, that's for your own pleasure, but the nitty gritty of creating time and knowing what you're doing, that's get you the gigs. Yeah. It, it, it's actually so true. You could not play a solo your whole life and work all the right. time. Like Leroy you... Vinegar didn't, never played solos. Mm -hmm. uh, rarely, you know, he was, you know, West Coast baseball. Yeah. Worked all the time, continually. I remember uh, Crenshaw, when working with him too. He never really liked to play a solo. No, no. He just wanted to play it. No. I mean, he could play nice solos, but he didn't want yeah, it. He didn't care to. He didn't care to. <laughs> so what, but coming back to that recording, what was the special thing about Louis Belson from your perspective? Well, the, the same thing we're talking about. I mean, here he was, Louis Belson, you know, and, and yet he, when, when you played, he played with you. He listened and played with you. You know who else did that to a great degree was uh, Bernard Purdy. I worked, used to work with Bernard Purdy a lot. I haven't seen him recently. But I first came to town, he was huge. He was a big star. He was like the king of the drums. And I sat down and played electric bass with him, and I, I knew that he was listening to me and doing everything I did. Just, it, and him, but, but Louis did the same thing. Louis just tuned right into you. And, and if you could keep, the, if you were kept the time going, he just would just flew it all around it and use it. You know, you could just feel him circling it, you know. And, uh, you know, and he was besides a wonderful human being. Unfortunately, he never got to meet him. He was a prince. But I've, I've heard that what you were talking about. It was interesting because he kept, you know, the bass drum kept going pretty strong like in the no, no it wasn't so strong like maybe it just comes out of the recording but he would play all, all around the beat then you would like drive with him yeah. underneath and yeah. he would like kind of yeah glide a little bit on top. yeah he never he never he never overwhelmed the bass with the bass uh -huh. drum you know he had two bass drums yeah you know, always had to do, he could do rolls and stuff uh -huh. with him and it was great 
but he used them on his solos, but not, I mean, he never, he never tried to drown out the bass. Uh -huh. And uh, it's maybe just the recording, you actually can hear it. Oh, well, yeah, 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 yeah you can, as a matter of fact, but it's, but, and he was so accurate with it. He was uh -huh. so accurate with his bass drum. It doesn't vary. I mean, that's the big problem with bass drums. Is these guys don't learn to go back. They really keep great time with, you know, and it tends to thud. It can really be a it can be a drag if it's not. Yeah. I mean, it's original position in the band as the bottom at the beat has changed because there's there's the bass and there's other things going on. So it, it, you lighten up on it. I mean, you still use it for you still use it for a lot of things for accents and stuff and stuff and to hold the cymbals, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> to hold the tom tom. You know what I mean? You, know, you don't want some little guy there standing holding the tom toms. Yeah. Have a bass drum. Yeah. But we kind of look kind of funny. Right, right, right. Thing there. right. <laughs> but hit him on the toe, and he goes, "Ow!" <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, the bass drum has changed its its nature, at least in in. in it had. It, I don't know where it is right now. I don't. I think it's still in between. You know, you play. It's, it's still. Part of playing time with the bass player, right? it's like this little percussive yeah. thing just on top of the bass. Yeah. I mean, it can be so it can be beautiful. If but then it goes like in and out of it. You know, yeah, yeah, like yeah. You add more in. I love that. Uh -huh. I mean, that, I love it. But what I don't like is when it's playing four four, and I'm trying to go, and all the all the audience hears boom 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 boom. I want to stop and say, wait a minute, you don't need me. Did Louis ever? Ask you to play anything specific on the bass? Never, like, uh, never. I not didn't get one cue from him. He did like Ellington. He liked what you, he just let you do. He never told me. He never told anybody what to do. And he just got people who would do it. You know, I mean, he had a very specific ideas about his bands and stuff. He got people who really knew how to to follow and play the music that he enjoyed. He never. He didn't want to tell people how to play. He knew that was that didn't work because then you tighten them up, start mm -hmm. tightening them up and cutting their the circle gets tighter and tighter because they well I can't do this because the boss doesn't want me to do that. No, do it, do it. Mm -hmm. And if the boss doesn't like it, you won't be on the next gig. No? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it kind of undercuts also the idea of listening. You know, like learning and reacting from listening. Once you think about it, you have to do a certain thing. Yeah. And like you, your circle of listening just like right. It always happens. It happens. You start telling people how to play and they, they, they're, they're thinking and they're not playing. And, mm -hmm. I mean, there's a, at a certain point at which you, as you get better on your instrument, you stop really thinking about technique and you're just thinking about the music. I mean, this should happen early on. So, and uh, where all of a sudden it's automatic. You got all that stuff under your hands in, in, in your system, and you're not. But when people start saying, "No, no, no, don't, don't do that," oh, oh, it hurts. It hurts. Uh -huh. You know, and, and good music explains itself. You know, I mean, to, to, a, to a good listener, you, you, you know, how many times you walk in and immediately hit it off with somebody because they're good listeners. They, they know what they're doing. Um, we talked here for a little bit. Uh, does anyone have any questions to any of the topics we've covered so far? Uh, if you have, just un unmute yourself and unmute yourselves. Don't be speak up. Don't be shy. Even if I, I could translate, if you only speak German, I translate into English. Oh, there's five. One, two, no, three, four, five. Who's number five? Is it? I guess we're nobody speaking up. We're, we're not no hearing anybody. Questions. Should we be hearing somebody? But if someone would ask a question, we probably would hear it. Uh, I'll ask a question. Uh, oh, there you go. <laughs> I wasn't ready to talk, uh, but I'll, I'll talk anyway. Go ahead. Uh, uh, so. Um, I've always uh, felt 
that my relationship with the bass player in any group I've played in was the most important relationship I, I had. And uh, uh, everything else I, I hope I contributed to and they influenced me, but the relationship with the bass player always seemed to me to be um, paramount. And if it went well, I was very happy. And if it didn't go well, I was miserable all night. And, 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 and I don't, you know, I'm, and I'm not saying it's the bass player's fault. I'm just saying we either got along well or we didn't. And uh, I wasn't always quite sure why we didn't get along if we didn't get along. And um, I often thought it had something to do with our different conceptions of, uh, of the beat and where the beat was. Uh, so it wasn't that one of us slowed down or sped up necessarily, but uh, um, I, 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 people sometimes speak in terms of playing on top of the beat or on the bottom of the beat. And, uh, uh, and uh, sometimes there were just, uh, though I think we might've tried to listen to each other, it was just a wrestling match and uh, 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 some way in which we never saw eye to eye uh, about where the beat was actually. And so it always felt to me if I was the kind of person who was playing a little bit more on top of the beat, that it was always slowing down in some way. And I, and it was, uh, it always, uh, uh, so, so I, I, I'm, uh, I'm not sure what my question is. My question is something like, um, when you feel that there are these kind of different conceptions of where the beat is, uh, is the best part of discretion here just to sort of uh, uh, be compromising in some way and, and try to change your own uh, way of playing where the, where the bass player thinks the beat is and so forth. No, go ahead, Vito. <laughs> this is the age old problem. And I'm gonna let Vito jump into that one first. Oh, I didn't know it was an age old problem. I thought it was maybe just my problem. No, no, <laughs> I, I honestly, uh, as far back as I remember, um, once I got to, I started, I played in Berkeley in 19, I went to Berkeley in 1961. Yes, it was 1961, or was it 1960? I think, I don't, I, I have to check, but it was 60, 61. And some drummers, we hit it right off immediately. Other drummers, um, they they just played in such a way that that you couldn't lock in with them. And I, I you could say, well, it's my, I, it's my fault. Um, I don't know. I, I looking back. I mean, the, I, I've played successfully with a lot of great drummers, um, and one thing they always had was that crisp time that made you want to dance. Even if I mean, you know, even Elvin Jones, who who played loose, and, but when he wanted, boy, the time was there. You know, and and all you had to do is just respect it, play with it. But I didn't have to change my playing. I didn't have to change how I played. I just had to listen to how I was accompanying Elvin because he was, by the time I, a few times I worked with him, he was, he was uh, uh, very, a very big deal. So I wasn't going to walk into that. Elvin, here's how it goes. I was going to listen to him. And he was very accommodating as all the Jones boys are or were. And, uh, but his time was wonderful. And all the guys who I played with, it was Grady Tate, Steve Gadd, Vito. Vito's got beautiful time. We have a ball on the stage. Um, uh, and, and a lot of good play. So now you're not getting along with somebody. And I play, we've played together. So I know that your time is good. I know we, we did this. So unfortunately, I must say, uh, the bass player, <laughs> whoever he was, was not playing consistently enough for you to lock in with him, and it's it's hard. It's hard. I mean, a lot of a lot of people fall on the wayside, along off on the, along. What's the expression? Fall off along the way on the road or something. There's an expression I'm not saying because their their time is keeps them from working a lot. Their time isn't enough that somebody else comes in and makes makes the band happy and feel that feel that rhythmic thing and jazz really does. What I was going up was a deeply time-oriented uh, and swing-oriented business. And even today, there's lots of great players who, who insist on good time in their band. Um, 
I, I don't know where I'm going, except that I know when we played together, and I, we, we sounded great together. I thought we sounded very good. We had a ball. So, Thank uh, you. whoever mm -hmm. that bass player was, uh, don't write him a letter. Don't tell him <laughs> what we said. Don't tell him what we said. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Jay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let me just add one thing there. You know, like everyone's time stream is a little different anyway. Like everyone has a different interpretation of it. And just by listening, you kind of negotiate that territory a little bit. Like your bass player is a little bit up front or behind. You might lean, and this is not even a conscious decision, it's just that how you hear the music in, in the full context. You might lean against that a little bit to compensate and then bring the whole thing together. But also for dramas, I found that when you work with bass players with, with their time is not completely clearly defined, the only way to make that work is to don't uh, try to make your side of the time too, uh, too defined, like too narrow. It doesn't mean that you give up the, the time feeling, but you, you play a, a, a little wider beat that accommodates their, their place in there. So you, know, you, can play, you can play time very tight with the drama, or you can like, leave just more space in between. It then would accommodate situations, I think, like what you talked about. Maybe not perfect, it, it, it depends a little bit from person to person, but it, it could hide that particular situation. If you just think a little wider about how you play time that, that part of time. Yeah, yeah, I was just thinking as you were talking. I played twice with Tony Williams. Once was when he was he guested at Berkeley. He was 16 years old, 15 years old, and I was 20. And I couldn't play with him. I couldn't play them. He just was so, all over the drums, all over the drums. He was just going to show everybody at 15 who he was. Then about 30 years later, we, I was happened on a bandstand with him, with Clark Terry at a concert on the West Coast. And he, it was totally different. He had learned, oh yeah, bam, bam, ding, da, boom, da, beat, bing, ding, ding, da, 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 to keep the beat going because of Clark. And, and uh, he knew what Clark wanted. And I knew what Clark wanted. And all of a sudden, we were looking at each other smiling because uh, he was, it wasn't the Tony Williams who you heard on so many different, it was, oh, it's Clark Terry. And it was, it was so much fun to see how he had learned since he was 15, like we all learn since we're 15. Yeah. Tony was an amazing talent. Was it, uh, you know, since you mentioned Clark Terry, I was, I think, 20, 21, when I ended up on a tour with Clark in Europe. Mm. You know, I hardly could play drums back then, probably. But he was the sweetest person I've ever met. Like, I drove him, we drove him, I had a car, so he drove with me, the other ones drove in the bus, and, like, you know, just to hang out with him, oh. always drive around, listen to music. Yeah, it was an incredible two weeks. And then, after a few gigs, he threw, I don't know if you ever heard him do that, uh, brushes and brass on, like he does a, a tour just with a trumpet and him yeah. singing and, and drums. Sure, sure, yes. yes. Um, it was, was I got to play on a, a bunch of cruises music. with with him early uh, and concerts and stuff like that. And I remember what, uh, one night for one cruise, we were booked at a table with Clark, my wife, me, and Milton. And oh my God. The stories and the fun that went around there, right. and, and and both of them had had very difficult youths. I mean, uh, you know, being in the twenties, in uh, Milts Milts was you know, in the South. He was raised in Mississippi, and Clark was in St. Louis. I believe. And sometimes, and they were hilarious, and they sometimes would share the real deal with us. You know, whoa, I mean. But, but they were both just magnificent people. Yeah. Let's move on to another example, a musical example here. I picked 
uh, something with Gary Burton, actually, on, you know, the um, year of the recording. Do you remember that? Gary no, Burton, I, I do Terry remember. Clark and Joe yes. Beck. I remember it very clearly. It was in the 90s. And uh, I don't remember. I, I haven't really looked back. All I know is it exists, and I love the record. So, uh, so uh, the drummer on this one is Terry Clark. I don't know if everyone's familiar with him. He's a fantastic Canadian uh, drummer. He moved back to Canada. He right? moved back to Canada. He played every. He recorded every note that Rob McConnell ever recorded. I think Terry Clark's on every big band, every little band, everything. And he's a wonderful drummer. Yeah, wonderful. So let's, the record is uh, play the music of Duke Ellington. Let's play it. Oh, I should turn the volume up again. <laughs> In a mellow tone. In a mellow tone.
I cut you off there, sorry. Yeah. Oh, it's a demerit. It's a demerit. When I do something I like, I stand for it. I defend it. We can play it again. No. no. <laughs> Please, not that. You know, just uh, maybe after you can talk more about uh, uh, Terry Clark, but uh, like the first obvious difference from the previous example, I thought with Louis Basson, the time is very much on top of the beat. It's like it pushes, and with him in that rhythm section, it's much more in the middle. It like really sits on yeah. it. It's not that it's back, but it's like right in the middle, right. the center. Right, it's right. right. Very different right. placement. So yeah. it's yeah. Well, yeah. Louis, Louis never wasted time mm -hmm. with the beat. You know, he was right there all the time. He was. He. That's why he was so busy all his life because he just. Drove things. Everything just drove. Maybe it comes from the big band idea too. Yeah, in a way. and he didn't rush a lick. He uh -huh. didn't rush a bit. He never rushed. Yeah, it's not that, that something gets faster or speeds up. It's just like where yeah, you I mean, playing on the top and not rushing is an art. Yeah, you know? I mean, j just with not playing behind. It's just the whole feel of his drums was boom, zash, ding, boom, boom. You know, very definite. Uh -huh. And uh, uh, I mean, other people who are very, very good don't play with that much. I mean, Terry plays a little lighter. He's he's uh, more into the center of everything, mm -hmm. you know, and you can feel it. He's right there in the middle, you know. Uh, uh, some people are some people. Are, well, Dennis McCrell is like that. Dennis McCrell sounds like he's laying back, but he never is. He just he just takes a boy. He takes charge. Mm -hmm. He takes charge in his own life. Like maybe like someone like Mel Lewis would approach it. Right, right, Mel. Right, right. I've been playing a lot of him with, with the Jerry Lewis band. Uh, Jerry Lewis. Jerry Mulligan. Jerry Lewis. <laughs> Jerry, Jerry Lewis. Lewis band. It, wasn't that good. it didn't last that long. <laughs> it was very funny. Though. It was a very funny band. Everybody was cracking up, but uh, but Jerry Mulligan, I don't know why. Every time I'm thinking of that, that, that thing he does, he leads in one of those movies. Mm -hmm. um, but, but Mulligan, uh, Mel Lewis with Jerry Mulligan's concert band in 1961. You should hear. You want to hear some gorgeous drumming. And besides great playing but from the entire band, Mel is just phenomenal in that. And, and he explains who he is totally. You listen to that, you know who Mel Lewis is musically. He's just phenomenal. And yeah, he, he never, he didn't play on top. He could, with that, with that Chinese gong, you know, all of a sudden here. And you just knew that's where it was, that's where it's at. I mean, Mel took over, you know, and, if he, and once he trusted you, he, he, he let it go, he loosened up. Mm -hmm. But at first he just, that, that Chinese gong, that Chinese symbol, the bong, 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 So you, you played quite a bit together, right, with uh, Terry Clark? Yes, uh, a great deal. We had 10 years at the Blue Note. In the in brunches, ten years we started with Reagan and ended up with uh, Clinton. Mm -hmm. And uh, on the tenth year of my, they gave me a plaque on the very last day of the tenth year. I thought, oh, this is great. Here's to another ten years. I came in the next week. There was another band there entirely. I had been fired. I didn't realize the plaque was a was you're fired. <laughs> Starting to move on. So did you ever talk about playing rhythm together or? With no time with, with Terry Clark. Never. We never discussed it. We never. We we always. We rarely discussed it because we didn't need to. I mean, I just was wondering what. I mean, I, I was amazed at Terry's ability to play all the odd times. I mean, he could really play through the odd times. You know, he could he could just wander through seven eight like. I don't know how he did it. I don't know how people do. I still don't know how people do it because I have to. If I'm not don't know where one is every time on seven eight. I, I can't. I can't make it through two bars of odd playing through seven eight and be in the same place, you know. Uh, five four I've gotten better at. Maybe by the next ten years I'll be learning seven eight better. For what reason I don't know. Well, I'm Austrian. I have to stop at three four. Three four, yes, That's of it course. For me. <laughs> right, right. It's enough. It's enough. You it's just stay right there. <laughs> three four four four, but you add them together to seven four, and that's All the right. problem. You know, I was just thinking, I don't know why it popped in my mind, that when I first came to town, I studied with Lionel Fournier. Ooh. And 
he had this special relationship with Israel Crosby, the bass player, when they were the uh, rhythm section for Ahmad Jamal. And he told me that after, which is interesting, he said afterwards there was never ever any bass player he had like this deep connection with, ever. Like, you know, Israel Crosby unfortunately died somewhat early in a car accident, right? I don't know. I don't know. How but he was like, he was young. He were just had just started touring with Nancy Wilson. Really? Mm -hmm. Really? I didn't. I didn't know what happened. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what happened. But I didn't. But you listen to him now, and you hear that that's a very special place in bass playing. You know, he played lines that people hadn't played before that. You know, yeah. Played with clarity and pitch and lines that people had not. Well, Ray Brown was doing it. I think he and Ray Brown were kind of brothers in that area. Were they the same age, Israel? Ray? Probably. Probably close to it. I would think. Ray might have been a few years older, maybe. But they, Ray were, they were both playing very definite lines that made musical sense and very much in tune. And not just doom, ding, doom, ding, but just lines that just added to it. Of course, there were the trios that, that needed that. Uh, Ray with Oscar and uh, Israel with the Ahmad Jamal. But, and they really developed their playing. Oh, Israel was great, and his time was beautiful. He didn't thump his way as hard as Ray did. He didn't get the break. Ray could lift a, a battleship with his beat. But Israel just played strong and right in the middle of it. And, and so he and Bernal just, just right. They had that thing. That's why they yeah, worked correct, so well together. Yeah. I always thought that Bernal is somewhat of an underappreciated oh. drummer in jazz history. Could his whole concept with Almarty, the way he orchestrated, you know, together with what he, because Israel would play all those lines interjecting with the piano, and, <laughs> and Bernal would join some of those lines on the drums. Oh, he orchestrated them around the drums. It was really unique for a rhythm section playing at that time. He never got full credit for how he, both of them, and Ahmad too, but from the bass and drummer side, Israel. Well, Bernal, Bernal, Bernal was well them. known. He was well known. I mean, a lot of a lot of people knew Bernal for you know. I mean, he, that's what he did. He played with Ahmad, and he kept. He was like a background drummer mm -hmm. in a way. I mean, he was a quiet drummer. He never showed off. Never sexy. Never. But it, it, there was so much going on, and it, you know, it wasn't like showing off. But there was so much orchestration. I agree going with on that. Like music. Part I agree with you. That was a great trio. Mm -hmm. I was listening to Night Mist Blues uh, recently. That's a piece that that, that, that uh, Ahmad wrote. And listen to the three of them. If you want to get something, go look up Night Miss Blues with uh, Ahmad Jamal and listen to the, the three of them play. It's really special. It just does it so long. It's a long cut at, at a very slow tempo at the, at the Blackhawk in Chicago. The what interesting little fact is too with uh, Israel, uh, when I once told me that they never rehearsed. The trio, right. I mean, they have incredible arrangements, but they never actually rehearsed. They just played every day, and then right. the arrangements uh, right. developed organically on right. the bands. Then. Right. That's why they succeeded. Well, I, I had a, with a, with a trio with Buck, with Riley, and John Punch, and we played together 10 years, and we had a lot of good arrangements. And we had one rehearsal, and the band almost broke up because of it. <laughs> Maybe that's why I'm never had a rehearsal. Absolutely, absolutely. That's I'm funny. sure. He, he knew he knew a good thing when he had it. He did did not rehearse because they, they played so much that why did they need to? I mean, he would do something. He would get an idea, I'm sure, and for, and then uh, Israel would accompany it a certain way, and all of a sudden, uh, oops! And they'd learn, and Ahmad would learn to play the same thing again the next time, and Israel would play. Oh, and two weeks later they had an arrangement, mm -hmm. and a lot of them, great ones. I mean, you could hear it. You could hear. It. Because I can hear Ahmad talking to the band when he says, "Oh, we're going to do something." We want to like direction. He's going he to was take. definitely giving cues all, all yeah. along the way. Yeah, but that's also the you know how times have shifted because now no no band plays has an engagement for over a month at the club right. or two months. Right, right. except us when we do our nine weeks. Yeah, the, except us. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's you know it really has changed. Everyone has to rehearse now. You don't right. play now. Right. 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 All right, well, maybe that that'll too. change. Maybe we'll start getting those long engagements again. Who knows? Mm -hmm. I keep fantasizing getting a lounge in like uh, 
Scranton at one of the gambling casinos where we just sit in the lounge and play, you know, five nights a week and just play good music. And everybody comes in and wants to hear a jazz trio, you know. <laughs> Dream on. Um, are there any questions so far? I'm just, you know, I want to keep it open if anything, sometimes I forget to ask, but if anything arises, just unmute yourself and speak. It's a little, the screen is very small, so I can't see very well everyone. Yeah, but just, like here, but. if you talk, I can hear you. Do you want to go to the next example? Oh, someone unmuted, okay. Unmute yourself. Hey, hi, Jay and Bill. Thanks for doing this. Hey, Colin. Um, so, I don't really know what my question is, but it, it sounds, with everything that you're talking about, um, it sort of supports this concept of music as a conversation. And, I mean, it, it sounds also like it's almost luck or chemistry whether a, a bass player and a drummer are, are going to get along. You, you know, you, you don't know until you start playing really but it's not you know it's almost like i mean what what you're talking about it sounds like just even meeting someone socially at a party or something like that you know you can meet someone completely hit it off and talk for an hour without noticing the time go by or you know you can also meet someone and walk away from the conversation saying i, I have no idea where that person was coming from but i mean so there's no real question there it's just you know is, is that does basically does it come down to luck it, it, it you know Vito's, you, you said there's something you can do in the moment if if it's not clicking, you know, that you might loosen up the beat if, if, if the bass player also isn't playing a distinct time, which, um, I mean, that, that also sounds to me like it could be a recipe for disaster if, if, if both people leave a distinct time. <laughs> I mean, that, that could really go off the rails as well. Well, I've heard him go off the rails. I haven't seen him go off the rails. I've seen tempo slow down and the song almost stopped. Wow. Uh, because they couldn't get to the next beat. You know, uh, <clears throat> but in my case, as I get older, uh, and I play with people who have lasted through the business, the chemistry is usually there because these people know how to play. When you're younger and you're playing with people who are finding their way in the business and seeing what they really want, can make it, you, you run across a lot of players and they play differently or don't play well. Mm. Um, I mean, really well. And that's what we're talking about, playing really well. And uh, yeah, it's, it's a matter of luck until you get, get more seasoned and the, and, the, and the fallout occurs and you know, the guys who are left are really good players. You know, I mean, it's, it's a sad way to put it, but it's true. As far as I'm concerned, you don't you don't see bad players making it into their fifties and sixties earning a living, you know. And, and and you can hit it off with them. You can always find a way to play with them. I've never mm. been an old, a, a good successful drummer who might have couldn't find a way to play with. Mm. Is this funny saying there are no old old pilots? <laughs> right. There are no old old drummers. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, old drummers are fine. Mm. It's just it. it, it Bass players and drummers, they gotta be able, they gotta have a good sense of time. They gotta know what they're they're, they're there for. But uh, Colin, I really liked your question. I was just thinking about it. And it's really true, some of my best friends are bass players. Like, <laughs> over all those years hanging out, the people I spent the most time with, you know, when you're on the road and are uh, bass players really. Mm. I mean what, my favorite time in the last year was Driving stuff with Jay to kick, you know, we talk and goof around for hours. We you know, talk about our families and life and right. anything. There is really some uh, another connection you you develop, you know, which then probably infuses the musical side. It it I mean, music is all about communication. Mm -hmm. we, we with listening, and you know, you you, you communicate as just. Take from when we drive in the car, we take whatever we do in the car to the bandstand and just continue. 
right. the instrument, then we back up the instruments and continue in the path. And you know, it's now we're communicating now, and it, it, it really has that kind of feel to it. Yeah. Mm. I think I appreciated the question. I've never thought about it so much, but it's really true. I think that's what maybe earlier what Bernal once. When he told me about Israel Crosby, that's what he meant too. Yeah. Sure. Of you know, I've known I've known people who just got along like that. Who just who rhythm section guys who really got along with each other because they, they were doing their job, they communicated with each other, and they could play great music together, and they shared ideas, and that somehow the connection worked through their music. And, uh, you know, it's 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 like building a company. You got to get the right, you got to get the right people. You know, you got to find the right people. Have you ever? I mean, it's just like the opposite side. I was trying to think. Have you ever played with a drama you hated? Yes. And the music worked out. Uh, no, because no. I didn't hate him unless he played terribly and then insisted mm -hmm. he was on his way. And that was when I was younger. I had. You know, my episodes with drummers who played, who, who weren't sure of themselves, so they had to be bold. And, and they didn't know what they were doing, really. They had to be bold and wrong and strong, strong and wrong. And, uh, and uh, I never had any big fights with any drummers. I really never did, but I certainly knew who I didn't want to play with. You know. And uh, they, they, I was, I was crude. Proved correct is what I hate to say, but I proved them that they that they fell out. You know, they they couldn't make a living at it. They had to do something else. I mean, making a living playing music is a is a charmed life if you can do it. You know, but but it takes you know, it takes a lot of work. And consensual validation—that's a word I like very much. When you keep hearing, "Oh, I like the way you play. Oh, you sound great. You're fun to play with." Good sign. And I heard that when I was playing bass at a Dixieland band when I was 14. The drummer said, Man, I love playing with you. He said, You play great. I said, Oh, thank you. I said, Well, okay, I got to keep hearing that. I got to keep hearing that from the drummer that he likes to play with me, that he likes the, the way I hooked up with him. And they, they, that's an important deal. You know, consensual validation. If you don't get it, why are you not getting it? Why do people not tell you you're playing great? Maybe because you're not playing with them. I hate to be so bold. It kind of ties back into your earlier question, Steve, right? Like how to work with a bass player that doesn't feel right. It's kind of, you can make it work temporary, but you can't really make it last in the sense, right? Pro maybe not. Probably not, unless you find some magic key that you. Unless you discover some new music that the two of you are creating together, that who knows how new music comes to, to pass? I mean, it's always accidental, and then you'll like it. Can I make a, a bass comment? I don't know if it's a question so much as a, a comment. Sure. Um, I've listened to you, Jay, on quite a few of the Eddie Higgins trio recordings. Oh my gracious! And uh, apart from enjoying the bass lines, which I consider to be almost like a, a standard reference point for if I'm thinking about a standard and I'm thinking about bass lines, I might often refer to some of the stuff you did with him. I do admire it. But I also noticed that, just talking specifically about the drumming aspect, that a lot of your fills, <clears throat> which can often be like mini ego trips, for bass players, but they seem to lead back to a rhythmic purpose, you know, and I, that's what I love about them. You're, you know, and I was listening to Nardis, for instance, recently, which is quite a spacey sound, and there's some definite cues in there which come from the, um, the fills that you do. And uh, just wanted to say, I enjoy that a lot, and I think it must give a drummer a lot of confidence and the whole band, in fact, when you know where the downbeat is, because you're sort of hearing it a few seconds before, because it's coming via that uh, little rhythmic 
phrase, you know, but it usually lands in a in a very definite place, which is cool. Yes, if you, if you can play those fills and they really give everybody a sense of where it is. In other words, the fills have to be really rhythmically accurate. And uh, I, I heard Ray Brown doing that with Oscar when they started making those records of uh, covering cover records of Broadway shows or, or composers. And I, I marvel at how Ray, every fill just had such good time that everybody knew where the time was. Right. Um, and and uh, whether it was commandeering it um, or just filling it up. Um, I sometimes excuse myself of, of playing too many fills on certain records, but uh, nobody told me not to. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, they weren't inappropriate. They just kept the, they kept right. the thing rolling along. It was and like I a never, I never heard anybody, Nobody ever told me, don't play those fills. <laughs> um, oh, no, one time, uh, the... the uh, writer of Hotel California, what is his name? Um, the, the, the famous drummer, it was the drummer, oh, it was this drum. I played Hotel California, I was playing with Les Paul down at Iridium, and he had this, the, the fellow who wrote Hotel California, the guitar player, who eventually got kicked out of the band, and I put one extra note into it, and he got, he took the bass line goes like this, yes, sir, yes, sir. <laughs> Yes, sir. Um, uh, you know, that doesn't happen too often, but if you start taking liberties with a, with a hit song that a person's made a million dollars with and doesn't want to hear a change on it, well, you're going you're gonna to get that response. You know, throw in a little extra cute that he doesn't find cute, you're dead. Not going to work. <laughs> and that's the, that's the history of Phil's of my fills, but I like them because they, they, they help also, you know, they're fun, they're fun. Yeah, I think the, it adds to, to the dancing element, uh, it's like establishes rhythm in different places and yeah. kind of everyone can relax around it. As long as, long as they really, they really do what they're supposed to do. You know, keep the rhythm going and flowing and and at a trio or something, everybody gets a chance to show off and be, you know, you know, say what he wants to say. You know, you try not to overwhelm it, but you get to do it. Who was one of the first bass players who started that Phil stuff? The I, Phil stuff had to be Jimmy Blanton. Blanton. Jimmy Blanton. I had a discussion with Ray Brown about Jimmy Blanton. He said. Uh, uh, he said he took Jimmy Blanton and tried to refine it, tried to simplify it. He said he didn't want to play as many notes as Blanton played. He wanted to play simpler and with, with longer notes, longer tones. Blanton sort of thumped. He, well, of course, he played gut string bass, and he had, he had to play in a big band. The bass had not evolved that far. I mean, it's still very good. If you listen to Blanton play, <laughs> it's amazing stuff. But Ray took it and, and smoothed it out made it hipper, and, uh, but he, Blanton, I think, really started that. Start, really started to make the base of commenting instrument, and not just a rhythm instrument. Yeah, like the only other one then, I mean, a little later, was Israel Crosby, I could think of, but. And, and uh, Oscar Pettiford, Oscar, Oscar Pettiford, Pettiford, you know, oh boy, Pettiford was, you know, I mean, I'm still, Waking up to Hitler, his genius, you know. I, I, he was one person I didn't listen to that much until I got older. And now I go back and, wow, what a player. I mean, him, him and Duke Ellington, he did a trio with him and Duke Ellington and somebody else. I forget what it was, but boy, is it good. Anyway. There's actually a beautiful record for drummers uh, that doesn't have a drama on half the record with Oscar and Marky Thompson. Maybe it's called Trick or Tourism. Yeah. I'm not sure. Yeah, but it's fun to play along with. You get to play with Oscar Petty for it without uh, having another drummer there. He was a great player. He was a great player. 
let's listen to another little example here. Uh, maybe a little more modern territory now. This is with Bill Charlotte and Bill Stewart is on drums on this example. <laughs> Got the DJ all worried now. Didn't want to cut off before there. <laughs> it might have been a hot face like that. Yeah, I was waiting. <laughs> was very so this is a very different recording. My uh, heavens! I, I, have, I haven't before. heard it in a long time. I didn't know what I didn't know what song I was playing in the beginning because I, I was I was getting out on the it's kind of interesting arrangement because the melody doesn't get, really get stated on the right, right. End. And I, I swear I didn't have no idea what the song was when I was playing the solo on it. That it, it, how how deep is the ocean? I had I had no idea. I couldn't I couldn't have guessed what it was. So that's really a sign of a good bass solo when you don't know what the hell the, the <laughs> bass players play. Yeah, but also the, the rhythmic approach was 
you know, very different. The time was there, but like Bill was all over the place, like interjecting. Yeah, oh yeah. Oh, he does that. Work, he know? does that. Which, which is his style. I'm, yeah, I'm, but, you know, he's, 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 he's so very different from the drummers we heard before. You know? Right. Like, so how, how do you adjust them for it? Like it, it changes the feel of time completely. Someone is very busy on the drums. But what do you do on the bass? Well, first of all, I don't play any fills. Mm -hmm. I, I, there's just no room for them because, exactly. and, and with Bill Stewart, you, you, you allow him to, to have his say because, uh, you know, um, and it, I'm not, it's not that I felt it was like thwarted, but, uh, you know, he's, he, I, as the song started off, as I listened to it, I felt like he and I were a little different place at, as the song started off, um, once once Bill started, once Charlotte started to play, uh, I felt that Bill and I had to sort of find that middle ground because he was not playing with the edge that I was playing with, and so we all we both came back. We both met in the middle. I felt myself backing up. I just just trying to get find the center of his playing where I could put a beat, where where, where to put the beat in, you know, where to put the beat. Because um, uh, I could see he was, he was going to play as he plays. You know, he's a brilliant player. So I just pulled back a little bit unconsciously. I know I just said, well, no, i got to make this really fit. So I, didn't, I, I just came back and turned it into a more of a modern chord trio. You know, spacey kind of sliding around at a trio, which I love very much, especially with players like that. And and uh, I think I, I, that's quite a take. A little, you yeah, know, I, I, I really like that. Take, yeah. I mean, but I, it's, it's I, so different. I, that's why I, I picked I, it. Cause I wish I had some idea what I was playing on that solo, because I just, I couldn't identify it at all. I didn't know what the hell I was doing. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. I don't mean to use semi on your on your <laughs> Zoom. Uh, but, uh, I just didn't know what I was playing. I listened to the solo. I said, I wonder what song, what, what, what was I doing? Because this is 10, 15 years ago. Anyway, I wonder what I'd do today. But it kind of it ties into a little bit what you talked about earlier. It's listening and negotiating the territory a little bit. You Absolutely. Know, it's, like it's a little bit of a give and take then. Absolutely. And it's not even a, really a conscious part, but like you, you find where the music happens and in that space yes. that where, yeah. every, where everyone can still yeah. function. Well, yeah, when you've got, and when you've got, you're lucky to have great players like that. I mean, mm -hmm. you, you're, you're quite willing to find a place and know that you're not going to sacrifice anything. You're not going to give up any uh, of your territory. You know, you've still got a lot of good bass to play. And the drummer, you could hear him. He just, he was playing. But he, mm -hmm. you know, it was very interesting stuff. I loved it. Mm -hmm. We did six six or seven CDs together for that during that period. Yeah, I don't know if I mentioned the name of the record before. It's called the uh, New York Trio. Yeah. So it's, the, it's all on Venus Records in, in yeah, Japan. And for $75 a CD, it can be all yours. Does, does anyone have a follow-up question or observation with this new material now? I'll, I'll ask something. Um, although I, I, I don't know if it's, you know, uh, in contrast to the previous recordings as to this one, but it made me think of it, the, the drums playing behind the bass solo there. Could you talk a little bit about um, how much or, or little you uh, personally would like a drummer to play behind your, specifically your solo, not, you know, not while the, the other uh, bands are taking so the band members are soloing, but like for a bass solo, is there ever a time when when you would like absolutely no drums? Would you communicate that in some way or? Yeah, I I, I don't think I've ever asked for no drums. 
I don't think ever I ever said, nobody play, I'm going to play by myself. <laughs> Sit back and listen. No, uh, the more the merrier. Uh, then I can use what they're playing for rests to phrase and not have to just, you know, I mean, when you're just playing by yourself, like, you, you, you gotta be very clever to make, keep it musical and still keep it moving. What do I prefer? Well, I, the great ones who I work with now, I can always, they know what I'm doing. Number one, they know what I'm doing. They know what musical ideas I'm after. Mm. They get it. And I'll hear them. They, all of a sudden, I'll start a phrase, and I'll hear boom, boom at the end because they knew that that's what boom, boom, was coming on the bass. I mean, little things like that. They, they know the music. They know what I'm doing. Mm. And all of a sudden, I can feel it. I'm not conscious of it, but I'm until later when I hear it back, maybe, or, or reflect on it. But, but you're playing comfortably because they've got you. They're holding you up and they're listening. And if, and if they, if they, if they uh, I mean, they know what you're doing. They know what the time is. And, and once they get to know you, they don't lose confidence. And you don't lose confidence in them. Sometimes you really need them to, to keep you honest. Mm. Uh, all of a sudden, you play a little phrase that messes up. And you're ting, ting, ting. And you go ding dong, you come right back with it, you know where they are, and, and they, they clear the decks and go bing, 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 bing for you, you know. Right. Uh, they, and they probably don't even think about it, but, but it happens. And uh, but they, what, I, what I like most is when they really know what I'm doing and pushing me on. I'm thinking of that old, old toy that you used to see, I used to see growing up of, of children hitting this big wheel, plastic wheel with a stick, and they'd be running down the street after it, like a big hula hoop. And you, you had to keep belting it, just to make it move. And that's what a good, behind the behind a bass solo, that's what a good solo, a good drummer does. He's there. Mm. He's, he's, he's encouraging you and hearing you and stuff like that. That's pretty complicated. Good luck. Thank you. <laughs> Do you want to take a drum, a bass solo? Sure. Should we do like a short, just bass sure. solo piece? Sure. With some obstructive drum accompaniment. No, no, no. <laughs> if you want to obstruct, you go right ahead. <laughs> I'll do anything you want. I know you were wondering, was this a prop or was I actually going to play it? No. It's a real bass line.
it's going to be forever. Did that answer your question, Colin? Yeah. I forgot what the question was. I like the answer. <laughs> It is really kind of you know, a communication, like you, you know, you hear where space is, and you, you go back and forth a little bit. Yeah, Vito likes to play fours with the with the band. He he loves that interplay, and he, he's very good at it. You know, he'll he'll do things, interpret what you've played, maybe copy the rhythm of it, or maybe not, maybe answer it, maybe go five miles off from it. But uh, he's made it clear. He made it clear to me that you really like to play fours and ace with the band and get involved in the tussle. Yeah, but sometimes I, I mean it's just my personal thing. But but it's like in a trading situation, it's a, more of the communication of it. It's a certain flow which I enjoy very much. As far as drummers are concerned, you've got to hear. Uh, which you don't want, we have not recorded any of Vito's serious solos. Uh, we have a couple songs where he takes extended breaks with him, and you get to hear real composition on the drums, like you don't hear too often, um, where something really, for some reason, I don't know why, but music having no words, why does it make sense? But it often, it, you, it can make tremendous sense, and that still fascinates me. What are we talking about? Because it's uh, it's it's just notes, you know. But but in one way, one reason I, I really kind of regret writing words to my songs. Words tell you where you're going. I said we're going here, but the music, if left to its own device, you have to decide where you're going, you know, and what it means to you. And you don't really consciously think about it, but you you're listening to it, trying to figure out. And somehow it explains itself. And uh, that's one of the views of it. It's a language that's without words. I, I, have, a, I have a question. Um, it, it has to do uh, with the, uh, the other side of the uh, soloing question. The, the question that was asked of Jay was, what do you like from a drummer behind your solo? Uh, and I, I want to address uh, what can, should, or doesn't happen behind a drummer's solo uh, from other members of the band, uh, usually either the bass player, or the guitar player, or the piano player, uh, if, if they want to comp behind the drummer's solo. Now, I, I, I've spent most of my drum playing life, many, many, many years, trying to learn how to take an extended drum solo according to the form of the tune. Uh, and um, I like I, I like Vito. I love to play fours and eights uh, on occasion and have that kind of uh, exchange with the band. I really that's that's what I did most of my musical life. But then I also decided I wanted to play some more extended forms of drum solo, and it's, it's very. I'm not saying that I've mastered it at all. I really haven't. I've gotten much better at it, but I find it difficult when other musicians play behind me uh, or, or try to play during my uh, attempt to play uh, uh, a solo according to the form, uh, let's say of the tune you just played. Uh, because I'm hearing a space or a, you know, a rest or a, you know, a, and all of a sudden I hear a chord come in then, which might be a nice compliment to what I'm doing. On the other hand, it might also be disruptive to my train of thought as what I'm trying to accomplish in my solo. And, and I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about it. Uh, uh, I, I've, um, I don't know whether, is it, uh, well, what am I trying to ask here? Uh, it's okay, isn't it, to have a conversation with musicians about what you want or don't want or or what you like or don't like behind your playing when you're struggling to get a certain kind of uh, expression of your of yourself uh, uh, across in your solo. Is that a clear question? Yeah, very, very, very clear to me. What can I answer? Yeah. I think 
what occurred to me just now was that when people interrupt or put chords in, they're trying to let the rest of the audience or maybe the band know where you are in the song because uh, that often... Or themselves. Or themselves. Uh, and if you're not where the, or they're not where you are, well, then that's, that's, a, that's a problem. Um, and so, so it comes down to making sure that the, the band knows where you are in a solo. And it's really, that's a hard thing for the drummer to do, to play a song. First of all, he's got to really know the song and have it going. Instinctively know where it is and what the tricks of it are. If there are any tricks to the song, maybe it's just a blues or a, a standard or something like that. Yeah. And then, <clears throat> and then when all of a sudden somebody plays something, and I know what, interrupting, it's, it stops your flow of your ideas. My first thing is incorporate it. Incorporate it. Use it. I mean, you know, nothing is... Uh, is a sacrament. It's uh, it's he goes boom, and you go boom, and you keep going, trying to, and you first of all finding out where they think you are, and maybe you're in different places. Then you've got to sort of negotiate the end of your solo, and what I would usually, what drummers usually do when that happens is they quick stop the form and just play it freely, and then then you know just play something interesting, and they stop trying to play the song because nobody's nobody's no knows where they are or they're not following it properly. And then, uh, then they let you back in with any number of different cues, uh, uh, you know, just something, do, ding, 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 bam, and you're back in. Um, so, so it's a, it's a problem. It's a communication problem, like any, like uh, sitting in a boardroom talking about a new product. Uh, you want something, and somebody wants something else. Uh, but, but. I don't know if you tell them not to play. Uh, they're trying to really make it simple. So tell, tell the rest of the band where you are, uh, letting you know that they know where you are. You know, there's a lot to that. There's a lot to it, just a simple little thing. And sometimes it's fun, you know, to, to be interacting with the band. Sometimes uh, I will, uh, on a veto solo, I'll just play out and play through it and try to confuse them. <laughs> Not really, but you know, instead of like on a take a veto, and I go, 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 let's do it. One, two, three, four. You know, I'm just fooling around. I'm messing with his solo, but he's quite willing to have me do it because he knows it's something else we're doing. It's interesting, and he gets. Uh, it actually, you know, it's like a surprise. It throws me in a different direction sometimes, and like I take a different turn. But it's no, like a ping pong game. At no time did our hands leave our bodies. We knew where we knew where the song was at all times. We knew where where we were in the blues. Oh, of course, it's not a hard song, the blues, but we knew where we were, beat by beat. And I'm messing with him, and he's messing with us. And the audience is listening, saying, they're enjoying this. They're getting the chaos of it. But it's still orderly chaos, whatever that means. So, so I'm leaving you in the same place. It's just, can you really play the song? Can you really, do you really know what you're doing? And when you're playing a solo of the song by yourself, do you really know what you're doing? Can you give them cues that you know, like every eight bars, blah, blah, blah. Or, and come back with a downbeat on one, just to let the band know here's where we're at. With a, with a band you play with a lot, you don't have to do that. You just you just assume, and you've learned that they either know or don't know what you're doing. And uh, uh, with, with a good band, the, the drummer get, doesn't have to do give any cues because they just people are following the song. They know where it is. Especially you know, just depends on how experienced you are with each other. Yeah. No. Can I ask a question? Yes. I, um, I'm a guitar player, so I don't know much about drums. And um, I wonder if you could talk a bit about the role of the bass 
drum and whether you try to synchronize that with the bass player or is it really more in, in jazz, more used for your own accents and it doesn't have much to do with the, what the bass player does? Again, I'm not totally sure if I understood the question. I mean, the bass drum sounds. Oh, the bass drum in particular. Bass drum in particular, yes. Because when when I heard you playing, I mean, I, I didn't hear much bass drum. So I, I wanted to know a bit about the role of the bass drum and whether you it has a special role and tries to synchronize with the, what the bass player does, or mm -hmm. or is it or not? It, it does, yeah, and when, I mean, we didn't really play much time now, it was more of an improvisational like, uh, exercise, but when I play time, I play 4-4 four, four a lot on, on the bass drum, but it, it's very soft, it's kind of, it doesn't overshadow the bass, it's just like it adds a little percussive head on, on top of every note. It's, more a felt sense than actually heard sense, but it, it supports the rhythm from underneath. It gives it like this this body, and then but then you, sometimes you step away from it and accent more on the bass drum, do more intricate rhythms. So you go in and out of this uh, constant uh, support of, of the time, and then you play some accents on it. When you're playing 4-4 four, four on, the, on the bass drum, you're telling the bass player where the beat is. I mean, unless you're listening and you're going to time it in with him, it's a difficult thing to do to get those two low instruments in sync with each other. Mm -hmm. uh, it can be done, but if it's going to be both be loud, the bass player's notes disappear because you, you, the frequency of the drum is taking up all the, of the... Uh, and, and modern drummers have learned to do that. Modern learn, uh, learned to play without using the bass drum very loud or using it as an accent, which is really brilliant, at, a brilliant accent uh, piece. I mean, Mel Lewis was so good at that. He just, he, he, uh, he killed me with the way he would accent with it. Well, most modern drummers do that. Let's, let's play some time for a second. I just want to demonstrate here that you can Like this, it's far too loud already. The idea, you have that pulse on the bass drum, but it's more of a felt sound. I don't know if you can hear it, it's because it's so low, but it, it, it sits underneath the beat. So, what you ask, just to explain that question? Yes, yes. I mean, it was hardly audible, the bass drum. When you played it softly, it was hard to hear. Yeah, and uh, I think it's kind of hard over, you know, with the microphones and everything, but if you're in the room, the idea is you, you really feel like the, the quarter note coming from the bass drum. Yeah. That's over there. Yeah. Okay. But you don't want to, if, if, if that gets too loud, then, you know, it destroys the bass player. It, it destroys the rhythm. If I have a that loud, The, the rhythm is basically over. But it's a good practice to really play the bass drum like in 4-4 four, four, to get, get it really tight with the rest of your playing. Uh -huh. One thing I love about drummer, good drummers is their whole set is coordinated. They, they, when they play, the whole set is in the same time. There's not one leg or one arm that doesn't quite match the rest of it. Everything is boom, do, 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 bam. I mean, you know, like, like you were just doing. I, that's fine. That sounds beautiful. With bass drum like that, I mean, uh, uh, I could play in two with that. I could deal with that. You know, I mean, if it, it, yeah, if the music called for it, if the music called for it, I would deal with it. But all night long, uh, you know, uh, no, it's not necessary because that's it's it loses it loses the bass, frankly. Yeah, you know, it loses like the you tonality lost, of the bass. Really lost the rhythm in. Yeah, and and you get, a, you get a sound that you don't get the sound of the bass, which is important to the band. And I actually, you know, I experienced bass players that told me to lose the bass drum. So it's a, uh, not everyone appreciates that either. I never told you that, did I? No. No. <laughs> no Why? But I, I had Why? Because it was perfect. Kind of, yeah. We've worked together a few years now. 
with my trio in different settings. And uh, so far, I've not told Vito anything. And he's not told me anything. We, we've talked more about playing today than we have in the last five years. Yeah. <laughs> when we, usually when we sit in a car and talk. We, we talk oh, in the car. Well, I talk about other stuff. Talk about, we talk about, about music. The flower like, shop. We talk tulips. about the, the tulip shop. Should we go to another? Tulip has, Vito has a very unsuccessful tulip business. <laughs> Nobody wants to buy yellow tulips. Nobody wants <laughs> yellow tulips. I have like thousands of yellow tulips right. at home. Nobody wants to buy them. I'm always ordering the tulips, and, and he never has enough supply. It's it's a bad business. Don't order from his tulip. I think I should. Try no, no, no. Keep else. trying. Don't give up. <laughs> yeah, let's go to another example. Actually, I, that's a really a wonderful record. <laughs> Sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, it's a Kenny Barron trio uh, with Al Foster on drums and Jay on not. bass. Believe it or not, that was my trio. Oh, was your trio? It was my trio. Oh, I thought it was Kenny Barron's. No, it was mine. Anyway, it's a, it's a really wonderful record. I, I love Al Foster's playing on this one personally. Uh, here's one uh, trio tune from that record, Cherokee.
That's what you get. You should never listen to your own records until you, for about 10 years later. Then listen to them and you'll see. And you like them. Then you like them. Because <laughs> after about 10 years, you're always criticizing yourself about what you did and what you didn't do. And oh, I could have sounded better. Now, 10 years later, you, know, you, just, you don't even know. Just... Yeah. Boy, Al Foster sounds great. Yeah, this is a beautiful recording. Wow. It, I, I've, I had forgotten I picked that two and two because of the. Trading, you know, you and Al, the, uh, Al is so deeply in the groove on that at, on those souls. Yeah. You listen to those souls. He is so, so much there. There's no confusion whatsoever about where he's at. But the, you know, the phrases like kind yeah. of glide in and yeah, out of yeah, each other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Comes Always. from you, and you go into this phrase. And I'm struggling. To, I'm struggling to play at that tempo, and he's just having a ball. Yeah. I'm trying to say, what can I do with this tempo? Oh, jeez. It's, it has beautiful symbol people. Oh, oh. Al Foster. Did you, you just did a recording with him? Did you play a bunch of other stuff? With Dan him? never played a lick with either of them. I played, I've, I've done a bunch of records with, with uh, Kenny, but that's the first time and the last time I played with Al. Just on that recording? Just on that recording. Oh, oh. my gracious. What a sweet guy and what a great player Al Foster is. Wow. Anyway, I hope we get to do it again. Mm -hmm. But I try to hire Kenny for trio gigs. He's too busy. He's always, mm -hmm. You have to book him five years in advance. Yeah. Forget it. I'm slowly running out of time. Let me just play a few. I have one more example here. Uh, the next one is with Roger Callaway and uh, Peter Erskine, actually, on this one. Let's just play a couple of minutes. So we cover one more.
Sorry, it was abrupt. Uh, so, Pia, first came it, it reminds me a lot of what Mel Lewis would approach. It's like this middle of the middle of the beat. Yes. A very deep groove. Yes. Beautiful. He's a dream. And he's, he's a dream drummer. And he didn't, you know, because we talked about it earlier, what to do behind the bass solo. But it, I guess it's different. I mean, it changes from tune to tune a little bit. But in this case, he just played a very simple beat, even like with the cross stick on four. Yeah, he just let me do it. Yeah, he, just he gave you all well, his space. Well, he and I don't know each other. We we, we did we never played together before this record. So oh. so he didn't know me. He didn't want to step on my toes. Uh, he didn't want to like take any chances that I, you know. I mean, I think he, I think he was being careful. Um, but listen to the time. I mean, he he doesn't he doesn't jump in there like like you might. You know, because you know me. You know, you know, you know, you know, you know what I'm doing. You know what I'm up to. And you know, I don't care. But he but, doesn't really didn't need it. It was just no, no, for this no, no. He, but he, but, he, but, he, but it was such beautiful time. I've been able to do anything. You know, I messed up, rushed. It doesn't matter. It sounds like I know what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, he was he was great. It was a little a pleasure to work with him. Yeah, incredible drummer. Yeah, I but mean, just you know, it's so interesting to. And this, this is just like, I played five different recordings. We talked about it a little bit earlier. Like every every drum that is signed to is different yeah. than you know, yeah. Yeah. the previous one. It's like you you kind of find that pocket with all of them. Like you find where the groove is. Well, they know how I play. They do know I'm, I'm a straight ahead rhythm player. You know, they all know this. I mean, they hear it. Bing, ding, ding. I don't rush. At least not noticeably, I don't drag noticeably. You can't feel the tempo going someplace. The fact is we all rush and drag a little bit, but microscopically. It, it, the idea is not to feel it. If you don't feel it, then it doesn't drag. If you get that sync, sense of syncopation, bam, 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 you know, if that feels, you get that. And it stays there. That means that I bet you microscopic you can see, oh, well, the ending's one millisecond faster than the beginning, or one millisecond slow. That's probably no jazz recording that ends up. Right, right, no, no, so, but that's not what I'm talking about. Per perfection is not the idea. It's getting groove and staying there. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's always been the thrust of my plan. You know, that's obvious, I think. The better or for worse, richer or poorer. Mm -hmm. 
Um, we're getting close here to the end. We are, uh, I would like to open it the uh, rest of the time for any more questions or clarifications. Or... First of all, no, that's still oh. everyone still here. Is anyone? Oh, so I'm seeing a lot of red X's on the board. Oh, yeah. Okay. Somebody jump in with a question. Anything. Something nice and stupid. All right. I guess I'll go. Good. Um, would you talk about, this is for either of you, um, uh, the nature of the relationship between bass and drums. Does something happen? Is there more or less freedom or um, when you're playing in a, a trio situation versus a quintet and above? Um, does, does something change with the dynamic? How do you think about that? Well, go ahead. Go ahead, Professor. If at all, maybe it's maybe it's not different. <laughs> uh, no, it, I, I mean personally, I feel the smaller the format, the freer it is. You know, like trio is for me the freest kind of format. It's like the more people you get, the more you have to account for everyone else and you know the more you narrow down to support the whole thing it's like the bigger the thing becomes this like the smaller your space becomes in a sense mm. you become more foundational and for everything else mm. i think from my perspective yeah but it's, it, it, it's, somehow i never feel i don't feel like uh, playing in a quintet or a sextet is limiting it it, it because you get to hear all this if they're good players, you get to hear a lot of great music and you get to contribute to it in your own way. Uh, like a bass player, just hang in there and play those roots and, and, and inspire everybody. I mean, not roots, but, but play basically so people can really take off on it. You know, uh, horn players can play on it. And of course, the arrangements will tell you what to play a lot of the times. Um, but I never feel limited by it. Uh, Sometimes I like being hemmed in. I like the responsibility of shutting up and playing something that the six, that the sex makes the sex head sound good. Yeah. Yeah. I think it becomes more of an orchestral part than the bigger yeah. it gets. Like yeah. you, you get your function. It does. It's not that the music, just the sound of the music changes. It's not a value judgment. I usually prefer to play alone anyway, but. <laughs> Just no, no, no orchestra no, at all. Yeah, no, no orchestra at all. Yeah, okay. I don't like any distraction. <laughs> but I, there's a certain freedom. I really enjoy all those for, notes. For uh, like within a trio for for drums, there's a lot of freedom you know, to orchestrate and do a lot of stuff. Even if something goes wrong, there's not so much like you know. There's always there's the bass that catches the stuff. Personally, I, I, I feel I really like trios. Me too. I love it. So, any anyone else? So great to see the perfect marriage today. Thank you. Perfect marriage. Thank you. Thank you, mother. <laughs> great to see you, Tomoko. Yes, uh, we're going on a honeymoon right after this uh, telecast. Yeah. <laughs> Flying to, to Cancun. First up to 114th Street, then, then meet up 88th Street. <laughs> How are you, Tomoko? Better than ever. Huh? Better than ever, she said. Better than ever. Does everybody know Tomoko? Can, you, can everybody see Tomoko? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> She was absent for most of the show. She had to uh, do the lawn, I think, right? No. Okay, maybe not. You know what, since Tomoka is here, Cassidy, I, she is, had... are there any other questions that anyone want to say something? Otherwise, I just play a tune to finish. I have a question for Jay. Uh-oh. Are you, are you going to keep working as hard? How do you keep all that energy going? <laughs> I know, I know, it's, it's strange. Uh, but music, music makes me very energetic, right? And um, and I, I try to take care of myself. I, I'm I'm 81, 
I yeah, you're actually to, bad. Uh, I try to uh, take care of myself, eat so that uh, you stay vigorous and light, and uh, I don't drink anymore. Mm -hmm. And uh, stopped about you know, a while back. And uh, I try to keep my weight down, and, and I have to work hard on I have to I have to exercise. I, yeah. You know, I, and hopefully the next uh, nine or ten years will still be full of energy. Yeah. And maybe even longer. Big yeah. plans for the two. Big plans. Yeah. Big plans. Well, good luck. Keep it going. Thank you. Thank you. I will do my best. <laughs> and so will Vito. And so will Tomorrow. Yeah. Thanks for today. Also, it's been fascinating and uh, really great. Thank where, you. Where are you uh, tuning in from? I'm in uh, on the east end of Long Island. Oh. But uh, I'm obviously English originally, but I moved here in 1990. That's uh, been here a while. Yes, you have. Yeah. I can hear it. I can hear it. Yeah, around the same time I came over here. Oh, yeah. 92. Yeah. Yeah, I don't have any plans to go back. So, you have plans to go back? No. <laughs> oh, oh, no plans to go back. Yeah. No, I think I'm a local now, kind of. Good. Glad to have you. Yeah. I want to. I want to thank you both too. It's been very uh, wonderful listening to the two of you speak about the inner workings of the bass drum duo. Thank you. Thank you for for joining. Great to see you, even on these little pictures. And I really appreciate everyone's questions. Those are the great. Yeah, thanks for participating with us. Thank you, guys. Thinking of let, stuff to talk about. Let me play one more short uh, cut from uh, the Jay's latest trio effort with Joy. And kind of a, a mellow cut, but it's a live out on the road, his story. It was my chance to join a band on tour I never had been on the road before To pass this up I feel for Wasn't doing much in school I knew this was my first big break To pass this up would be a big mistake I long to see the land so I joined the band. Take a long ride through the night. The road is slick, so hold on tight. Trucks pass by with little warning. 5.30 in the morning. Playing dances in Midwestern towns. For folks dressed up in western suits and gowns Drive from Texas to Alaska One stop in Nebraska Atlantic City play the pier The diving horse is wild with fear and my metabolism slowed from life out on the road. Life out on the road. Life out on the road.
I've been Carson Chimo hotels, tiny rooms with funky smells, a band of gypsies on the road, sell your body, sell your soul. Endless roads that never turn, you never stop, you never learn. And for lady friends, you got no time right there in your prime. The road trip finally ends. Then you find you've made yourself some lifelong friends. But you've turned from a prince into a toad from life out on the road. Life found on the road. Chaotic and most unprosaic, but another little piece in life's mosaic. Maybe someday write an ode about life found on the road. Life found on the road. Life out on the road.